Fan Lounge by SpringPod. I hope you've already tuned into some of our previous talks and found them interesting, but don't worry if you did miss any of them, because you can catch up on demand at a time convenient to you. Just go to learn.springpod.co.uk. If this is the first time you've come across SpringPod, we are an early careers network for young people who are considering their next steps, be it employment, apprenticeship, college or university. And as part of our Learn Lounge series, we've been running for a couple of months now, we'll be bringing you lots of inspirational career stories and some insights from some well-known names. So far, I've had a range of guest speakers, a huge range, including international explorers, news presenters, influencer talent managers, sport personalities, and many more. And we're excited to add today's guest that growing list of speakers. But more on that shortly. So I hope I'll be hosting this session of the Learn Lounge. Just a couple of pointers before we get started. The talk should last around 45 minutes. Please do ask questions to our guests. Remember to tag us on social media with the hashtag Learn Lounge to spread the word. And finally, we are raising money for the Children's Trust. So if you would like to, please do donate. So today we're joined by award-winning UK music photographer Andy Ford. Now, some of Andy's projects include shooting for music magazines such as Kerrang and NME, and even directly for record labels such as Universal and Sony. He's an alumnus of Plymouth College of Art and he's worked with artists including, ready for it, Mark Ronson, Biffy Tyro, Dua Lipa and Beyonce to name a few. And today the two of us to share some cool insights into what it's like to work as a professional music photographer. He'll be sharing his visual journeys in early days as a student shooting small local shows to working with some of the biggest artists. I can't wait to get started. Andy, welcome to Learn Lounge. Hello there. How are you doing today? Not too bad, not too bad. Uh, nice uh, rainy Bristol Bristol day. It's all good. <laughs> the sun is starting to peek out through the clouds now, so hopefully that will change. Sure. So we're going to hear all about your career today, something that's really exciting that maybe a lot of people are interested to know the certain steps to get to where you are, because it's not the kind of career that you see a clear path laid out. So let's start with what you actually do. So tell us a bit about what you do as a music photographer. It's time to spill the beans. Cool. Um, right. So as, as, as we've discussed, I'm Andy Ford. Um, I'm a professional photographer. I have been for the last eight years. And obviously, I'm mainly known for my work within music. So that means I get to spend a lot of time in an office that generally looks like the, uh, the slide you can see there. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick rundown on the different types of shoots I, I generally do um, and the types of clients that amazingly uh, pay me to do them. So as we said, a lot of my work is editorial, which means it's generally for um, magazines and websites. Um, be a selection of some of the things there that might be uh, live reviews, so shooting concert images to go with them, might be festival coverage, or it can be um, portraits to go with magazine features. And sometimes you're lucky enough to uh, shoot the front cover, which is always, always uh, exciting if a little bit nerve wracking. Um, so yeah, I get to travel quite a lot as part of my job. Um, sometimes that can be flying out with a band part of the, as part of the tour, it might be on a magazine commission uh this one was from last summer with a, a crazy german metal band called ramstein i went out there <laughs> to do a, a kerrang feature with them out in in berlin and they gave me this amazing access into the middle of their insane pyro show and i managed to uh, get some great shots and escape with both my eyebrows still still attached so that was, <laughs> um as we got here so yeah, often it might be uh, sort of uh, working directly for the people putting on events um, mm -hmm. or, the, or the venue. This one here was from the Enemy Awards in February, just gone. Um, the 1975 headlined it, and yeah, it's yeah, it was a it was, it was quite an exciting night as you can see. Um, yeah, it's also uh, the the live element of what I do is only is is only part of it. Um, portrait is, is a massive part of what I do as well. And as I said, they might be for magazine covers or for features, or it might be directly for the artists for them to use in 
of album artwork or promoting yeah. for an album campaign or for social media content. Um, sometimes it can be quite raw stuff, you know, like this, just sort of uh, this little peep shot um, from outside Buckingham Palace. You know, sometimes it can be very sort of raw street style stuff, just with minimal lighting and fuss. Sometimes they might be more elaborate affairs in the studio with uh, lots of lighting and a smoke machine in full flow. Uh, like this, this, back, this shot here was with a band called Creeper for a grand cover at the, at the start of the year, unveiling their sort of new look. Um, and of course, no music photographer spends too long in the game without spending uh, a good portion of their summer uh, festivals. Again, that might be for websites or magazines, or you might end up being part of the sort of official photography team, um, and that can get you some amazing access. Like this shot here was at Glastonbury a few years ago, and I managed to get a, get a slot in one of the cherry pickers that goes up above the Arcadia part of the site and got getting this, uh, this mad viewpoint. Um, it's quite interesting that you mentioned um, that you getting quite nervous because I would have thought that would happen maybe early on in your career or when you were at college but that might bond by now but do you still find that you get nervous before these shoots? Um, it's definitely it's not quite the the absolute crushing anxiety that I used to have but <laughs> I think there's definitely an element of um, no, it's almost like performance sort of anxiety it's yeah. it's a to be honest, I'd almost get worried if I wasn't getting slightly anxious before she, because it may, means you're not, you don't care enough about it. Yeah, or you're too comfortable. Yeah, yeah, you're possibly being yeah. complacent. I will, I'm always looking to push myself forwards and stuff. So I think that sort of nervous energy can be a good thing so long as you can harness it and not uh, let it sort of get, get in the way of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Oh, and. Sorry, um, and yeah, also as well as a lot of the magazine and um, sort of record label stuff I do, there are quite a few weird and wonderful commercial commissions you end up doing. This was one of the stranger ones a couple of years ago when the uh, Guitar Hero game uh, launched their live version. They put these big mad <laughs> festivals with audiences full of extras and stuff, and they had me there as a unit photographer shooting them as I would like a normal festival. But, um, these raw images that went into um, like the in-game menus, and I'm actually um, in a lot of the gameplay as a, as a character if you've, if you've ever played it. Um, and yeah, one of the other brand ones, one of the best brand ones I got to do was um, I spent a, a little bit of time working with Converse on this rubber track project they did, where they used to book out big slots of recording studio time and invite up-and-coming artists in to, in to do that. And um, yeah, I, I basically got to spend a few weeks at these studios shooting these artists coming in. But we did a, a two-week residency at Abbey Road, which was which was pretty amazing. And sometimes it might just be sort of branded events where you're basically paying to you know produce content, kind of in the style that you would normally, but just making sure those all important logos are visible and that, uh, that, that yeah, those, those logos and products. Can uh, make a big difference to the, uh, the resulting paycheck as well. It's, it's so um, mind blowing to see all the different things that you do. It's like one week is not the same. When you think of a music photography, you might necessarily think that you're on the stage all the time taking pictures of concerts, but it's not that at all, is it? Um, it? I mean, that's obviously part of it, but yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, when people think music photography, they think that sort of key moment on there, but obviously there's a lot, a lot of other various aspects aspects to it yeah yeah but um yeah i think we yeah we if we if we rewind things right back to uh the beginning of all this um go back to i think it's probably 2007 when i actually like got my first proper camera um so yeah i was i was a chef living in uh in cornwall and basically just obsessed with surfing um and growing up being massively into surfing and skateboarding, you're surrounded by a lot of photography. They're very visual cultures. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, that's how I got into it. Uh, this, this shot here is one of the first ever rolls of film that I, I photographed at a little uh, little show in Plymouth. But um, prior to that, like 
surf, surfing was what got me into photography. Like I say, I was working at working in Cornwall, and after one long summer, I, I took the trip to go to Southwest France and have a little bit of money left over. So I got myself a camera and uh, just to get, get some nice wave photos to annoy my friends with, really. And then, yeah, a few days. Do you remember what camera it was? Uh, I think it was a weird little Fuji bridge camera. It's was, it was about the best I could afford with the, uh, the very limited funds I had at the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, yeah, and I noticed I was starting to skip evening surfs to take photos on the beach of people surfing. I was like, oh, and maybe I, I, there's a little bit of love for this photography stuff in me. And when I got back from that trip, the camera started coming in all my uh, surf missions up and down the coast. I started to take um, photos of like, the landscape and stuff like that. And it really sort of spiraled out, out of control from there. Like I said, surfing was really my first focus. And I, you know, after a few years, I managed to start getting a few things um, published in surfing magazines and stuff. But with photography, you find that whatever else, whatever you're interested in, you end up pointing the camera at it. And as well as surfing, I was very into sort of punk and hardcore music. Yeah. And Southwest, where I was living, had yeah, quite a vibrant, weird little underground scene. So, you know, initially I just took a, a camera along to one of these shows, just trying to, it was quite wild affairs. So I wanted to try and get a, a photo that sort of just on my wall at home that captured a little bit of that energy and very quickly I got quite addicted to the what the, these were the kind of things that were going on so I, was, I got quite addicted to that energy and trying to like capture that in in, uh, in frames and so, um, yeah and just became, became this thing of shooting a lot of these shows and just trying to figure things out how I could make things better whether that was the equipment I was using, how I was processing images, like the access I was getting. And it's, you know, doing this, I started to meet people in, in the bands, people who were putting the shows on, people who worked at venues. Just, it was the, the early stages of starting to build that, like, all-important network, which is, is really key into sort of finding your way through, through into, the, into the music industry. Um, it's quite interesting that you say that started taking the camera along to things that you enjoyed doing at the time because I'm sure a lot of people who want to get into photography maybe get their camera and then have no idea what they should start taking photographs of. Yeah. Um, yeah. So would you suggest to get into photography to maybe just take it along with you on your day when you're doing things that you enjoy and then you'll find kind of your rhythm with it? Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, I, I do think that whatever you're, you're passionate about in life is where your best work will come from. Um, yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's yeah, because, you know, prior, you know, five years prior to this sort of shot, I was, I was the kid doing that, you know? So I think if you, if you understand a, a culture and a, a subculture and you've got that passion for it, you, you know, you understand that energy and you, you know, I think that is always where your best work will come from, the things you're passionate about. Yeah. And how did you go from focusing on one genre of music specifically to begin with to exploring all sorts of different genres? Um, so, well, around, around about this time, I, I sort of decided, you know, I, I felt like there might be something possibly happening with the music photography. So I, so I, I sort of went all in and signed up and started to study at the art college. Mm -hmm. You know, I began to push myself, sort of starting to learn how to take portraits and things like that. Um, yeah. But it was, yeah, the, probably the bit, like the key sort of naught to 100 moment was um, in 2011. Um, I entered some of the, my punk stuff into the Enemy Photography Awards and managed to win it with this, this live shot here. And at the sort of uh, the little uh, exhibition awards opening thing, I met the photo editor of the Enemy. We got talking to her and she said that she really liked the work I submitted and asked me if I wanted to come into the, the office to show her some other work. So I was, yeah, on one hand, obviously really excited, but also a little bit nerve wracking because, you know, at the time I only had some sort of like injected scenes and bits and pieces. But I went, I went into the office and she fortunately saw something in what I showed her and yeah, asked me if I'd be interested in, in shooting for them and <laughs> I said, yes, please. And, like slowly I started to get um, odd bits and pieces. 
um, through from that. But that was definitely that real, real key thing. So I guess it was spending a few years quite obsessively shooting this punk and hardcore work. So and then you know getting in front of the right person who saw something in it. That was like really how I transitioned from just you know these little shows into yeah into the the bigger music industry really. If you cast your mind back, when you went to send that picture to their competition, was there any doubt in you who thought, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that or it's not going to be good enough? Was there any self-doubt that crept in? And how did you overcome that? If it was? Um, it's, I don't know, I've, the, the, I, ha, I had an element of confidence in it because it was quite different to a lot of the music photography that I was seeing. Quite often it, it was quite clean, Sort of, you know, nice, nice venue stuff. Yeah, I felt this had like a real rawness to it, which I don't know. It was people would either love it or hate it, you know. So, mm -hmm. but I, I think that's. I think the worst thing in music photography is for it to be boring. It should be. You know, it should always have some like something that expresses that feeling of what it was like being there. Um, but there's definitely an element of that imposter syndrome, especially when you came going from you know quite an underground scene like that into the main into a, quite a big mainstream world it was you know i did i did definitely feel like i was riding by the seat of my pants for a while <laughs> i was also very aware that those kind of opportunities you know there's the sort of thing that only come around a few times in a in a career that so you have to go grab them and yeah just just ride them out and do what you can and if we if we talk about um your experience of Plymouth college of arts how did you decide to go to that particular college and what was that experience like how did it help you um it was it was interesting i mean obviously education isn't for everyone but i, I was i was at a bit of a crossroads like i said i've been working as a chef for you know maybe like most of my 20s and it was something i'd sort of fallen into that allowed me to travel a lot and go surf go to live somewhere where i could go surfing a lot but um yeah i i had this things have been happening with photography that made me think maybe there was something there I just wanted to go all in and just you know see what I could do with it if I really really committed and I felt like studying it was best, the best way to really immerse myself in that I looked at a few places um, but yeah I went to the art I went to the art college you know they had really good facilities there but also it's quite a unique thing because everyone who studies there is studying something creative there's a really, it's a really good environment. There's a lot of you know, cross pollination between people, and you you, you you know you develop a lot of appreciation for other art forms, you know, like painting and um, like filmmaking and stuff like that. That still feeds into my into my um, work these days. And it's just when you're in that, a creative environment like that, it makes you want to you know do whatever it is you you do to the, the best of your ability. Yeah. And creative people, if you hang around with them, they tend to inspire you as well, don't they? So yeah, there's a there's sort of sort of energy energy about. Yeah. Cool. Do you want to share some more of your photographs? Indeed. So yeah, yeah. So this is just moving into some of my sort of earlier, early the early sort of magazine commissions I was starting to get. Um, so yeah. So yeah, it's so um, yeah. So this is like an early festival. Shop, um, and it's you know my, my thing going to festivals and, and things like that. I always wanted to try and get something that wasn't just your standard sort of safe safe shot. I was always looking for a unique angle, and um, you know this one I was a little bit further back from everyone, and it actually worked my advantage. Um, but I think yeah, you'll see in a lot of my photographs. I'm all. I think possibly it comes from shooting surfing and stuff when I was younger. I was always you know I had an eye for action and that like key moment in the in the images you know like you know half a second either side of that it wouldn't have been as good a shot it was for me it was often always about finding that like real key dynamic moment in there um a capture photo like that one how many times would you attempt that would it have been a case of taking like 20 different pictures and then getting the right one or would you have just timed it perfectly um obviously cameras these days they take a fair few frames in a row but um I, interestingly, with that shot, um, maybe a week, maybe a week or so before another another festival, I I missed uh, a similar shot and it was like really burnt me. So 
when I saw that, that something similar was happening, I was like, right, this time I'm going to make sure I, <laughs> make sure I nail it. The fail inspired you to get it next time. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it's, you know, there's definitely, there's things from like years ago that I still remember, like photos that I missed or, you know, just you weren't quick enough or you didn't anticipate it. Um, yeah, so, uh, where are we here? Do forgive me. Um, yeah, this, this, this was from a commission where I realized like some of the, the uh, quite exciting perks of working in the, in the uh, music magazines and stuff like this. This was, yeah. this was, yeah, I, re I remember getting the email for this and just being like, not believing it for about 20 minutes. So they basically asked me what I was doing next Wednesday and asked if I wanted to go to South Africa with um, a band called Bring Me the Horizon. They're playing a few festivals out there. So I flew out to this on the road feature with them. Um, and yeah, it's just that I still remember that feeling of getting on, getting on a plane to fly to South Africa and like, what else someone is paying me to do this? It's quite insane. And that was quite early on as well. So that must have really been a mind blowing experience. Yeah, it, I was I was still at the art college studying when it happened. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I remember having to tell my lecturers I wasn't going to be in for a few days. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it was, it was really surreal. And then it was, yeah, I remember coming back from it. And at the time, I was still having to work evenings at the, at the post office just to keep cash flowing. So, yeah, I got back at about three in the afternoon from the, from the flight from the airport. And, yeah, about three hours later, I was back in my normal job. It was, a, it was quite a surreal one for sure. That's quite um, a frank but also reassuring thing to tell the audience is that you might start out here, but you're not going to be making big bucks straight away. You've got to maybe have a part-time job, and that's okay. Yeah, it's 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 a real it's a it's a real you have to have a bit of a leap of faith moment. But it, I think yeah, you, it's it's sensible to build up to that moment. You know, have something else going on that while you sort of build these things. And it's you know, I think it's important for people to be honest about it as well. You know, it's not you know, it's is the struggle getting to that point and there does come a point where you're like right am i going to commit to this or or not and also it's quite an unpredictable um way of making a living you know even now sometimes you have you have months where you're like wow i'm killing it and then you might have a couple of weeks when it's really quiet it's definitely we not for everyone anywhere there's a global pandemic <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, that, that definitely um caused a few ch few change of plans uh, this summer um, but yeah, even when it's uh, even when uh, it's business as usual, there's um, yeah, it's, it can be an unpredictable thing, which which it isn't for everyone, you know. But if, sorry, if I just go yeah. So coming on to that sort of loop of faith moment, this this image here is quite a quite a key one for me because yeah, like I said, I've been getting these trying to get time off to do these commissions, and eventually it got to the point where they were like, oh, you can't have the time off to do. So yeah, an email came through asking if I wanted to go to Europe with Biffy Clyro. I was like, wow, yeah. And then went into work and they're like, oh, you can't, I'm afraid you can't have the time off. So I thought about it for about 20 seconds and went back to my desk and wrote out my notice. And um, yeah, went went and uh, did, the, did, the, did the magazine trip and yeah, been managing to make things, yeah, roll, roll from there. Um, but yeah, this one, it, I remember taking this shot and definitely, definitely feeling like I'd made the right decision. That looks absolutely amazing. And it, it looks as though you get a lot of behind the scenes kind of access. Would you say that? And what would you talk, what would you say about behind the scenes? Yeah. Of like a festival concert? Yeah, it's, it's def yeah, you definitely get some very sort of money can't buy experiences and get to see, you know, yeah, find yourself in some really privileged and surreal situation you know it's, yeah you, you get to have like that feeling of what it's like for a band standing on these massive festival festival stages and you know through your images you're able, you're able to, to share that and it's yeah it's it's it can be not quite nerve-wracking as well i remember the first few times i was on that big stages like that i was always you know terrified that i was gonna knock something over or kick a wire out of something and all the lights would go <laughs> off <laughs> Um, but yeah, fortunately, I've never, never, never had any clangers like that. Touch wood. <laughs> There's still time. 
um, but yeah, the, yeah, that that access and those experiences are a big part of um, yeah, what why you do it. You know, if you if you're a music fan, you know, get to be close to the sort of creative processes of these artists and the energy of these like massive shows. Yeah, it's a, it's a real privilege. Yeah, the, the energy that you spoke about from the early stages of your career and going to something like that, the adrenaline must just be crazy. Yeah, it's it's a, it's very it's a it's a bit of a strange duality because on on the one hand you're thinking oh wow this is this is an amazing thing but but you're also very sort of focused on getting the shot that you want to get as well so yeah you, you it's, it's a yeah it's not always you're not just standing there enjoying the music thinking oh what a great view <laughs> you <laughs> yeah you're usually thinking how you can get in front of some uh, co2 machine so you can get a clear shot and stuff like that but i think when you have successful ones like this one where you really sort of translate that what what it feels like to be there i think that's always a really successful shot for me uh, let's see what else we've got here um yeah again this probably goes back to what i was saying about finding those sort of key moments of energy and you know i i, I shot them like this to begin with because it was the only way i knew how to shoot and I think that kind of worked in my favor, maybe that I was shooting, um, you know, bigger shows in a way that I shot punk rock shows. So it gave my work possibly a slightly different aesthetic and feeling to people who are more used to shooting big shows, you know? Yeah, and was that, was that a lot of the early work that you've done? Did you, did you learn, was it a lot of self taught stuff? Like you tried a certain shot, you reviewed it, you kind of thought actually no or yes? Was it like that? Um, I think it, yeah, it was a, a bit of a trial and error thing. It's, it was, it was a lot, it was shooting a lot of shows and then going back to those, sitting with those shots and being like, right, what works here? What doesn't work? What's wrong with it? Is it to do with, you know, my knowledge of the camera or, the, you know, the shutter speed? Is it to do with the equipment I'm using? Is it the lenses? Is it the access I'm getting? You know, because I was shooting a lot of these shows in the same venues, it allowed me to sort of figure out the best places to stand and you know yeah cool yeah it was yeah there's that i think you know you definitely need to spend a good two or three years just shooting a lot of shows and just really sitting with those images and being your own harshest critic and figuring out you know how how they can be better you know and you, you need to sort of hold yourself up to the standards of people you want to emulate because eventually you're going to be competing against them for the for the same job so yeah i think no. You have to find your own creative flair, your personal thing that makes you a different photographer than anyone else. Yeah, definitely. I think it's about yeah, um, yeah, finding that thing that you do better than other people and really maximising that. But also at the same time, not limiting yourself. You need to be diverse. But I think for everyone, they've got you know, there's everyone has their own personal way that they see things. You know, you can't you can't teach that. So it's about finding. It's about seeing it first and then being like right how do i get my skill with a camera to that point where i can you know i i can you know, represent what i see well through the camera um yeah and again yeah it's the same thing really it was just shooting me i was quite lucky that they gave if there was generally if there was a, a show that was likely to get quite wild and larry they knew that i'd get stuck in so <laughs> a bit of a right for my own back i used to get Sent to a lot of the uh, the raucous shows, um, but, but yeah, so that yeah, it was you know I always I think of maybe about four seconds after I took this frame, I actually took it as I was falling over. So five <laughs> seconds later, I was I was on top of those people in the in the foreground. But <laughs> Have you ever had any like equipment break or anything during these particularly rowdy places? Oh, like. <laughs> Touch every bit of wood around, but I haven't had anything too bad. I've had a couple of flash guns have been destroyed, but for the most part, not too bad. I think, like I say, because I like years ago, I used to be the kid at that punk and hardcore show. I used to almost develop a bit of a sixth sense, like a space <laughs> awareness about what's going on around you. So you almost, you know, clock out the corner of your eye, someone's yeah. about to stage dive over you or something. You, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're yeah. aware of your surroundings. Yeah, you definitely need to be better. It's, yeah, it's, it's a health and safety nightmare. What can I tell you? But, um, yeah, you definitely need to be be aware when you're in these sort of things. It's, there's not always a nice, comfy photo pit for you to, to stand in. Um, right. 
the earth, Macbeth and conquering fear is so dramatic. Um, so yeah, that's so yeah. I guess we have talked a lot about live stuff, but I, obviously I was saying portraiture is a big um, is a big part of what I do as well, and I was always very aware that you know it was something that I found slightly terrifying. So you know, and, and I knew, but I knew that if I wanted to progress in in my career and be shooting, you know covers and stuff like that I needed to get on top of it so I really you know, forced myself to sort of learn a lot more about lighting and push myself when I had the opportunities to take portraits to try and you know try and elevate them and make something really good and I think yeah this this Mark Ronson shot here I, I, I remember it was like one of the first portraits I'd taken I was like wow like I, I almost couldn't believe I'd taken it because the you know it was it was never something I thought I was I'd be particularly strong at, but because it, because I found it terrifying, I sort of forced myself to keep doing it and face it until it wasn't an issue anymore. And now it's probably some, one of the one of the things I enjoy most in photography. That picture is absolutely brilliant. I'm really intrigued to know about in terms of the lighting and stuff and how you built those skills up. What did you actually do to make sure that you were more comfortable and, and how did you grow that skill? Um, I think a, a it's obviously practicing, you know, just you know, shooting your friends, friends and um, your unwilling girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever. It's you know, just practicing and practicing so that when you get in front of these people, you're you know, the the technical thing isn't something you're worried about. If you can concentrate on creating a a photograph like this, um, I was also looking at you know, look at lots of photography. Um, especially these days, you know, there's a lot of you know, photographers that are often posting behind the scenes photos. So I was always looking to see like how people have lit things, um, you know, just looking at the light and the shadow and trying to figure out how they, how these things look like that. And often, you know, it's, it's not always, once you start doing it, it's a lot less scary than you think, think it's going to be. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely confronting that fear and, Keep repeating it until it's not an issue anymore really when you meet these huge stars and you're asked to shoot them like this picture here do you have ever have to kind of disassociate yourself from who you're trying to capture the picture of do you ever pretend it's someone else or is that not an element that, of your concern um it's, it's definitely a strange one but i think where when you go into these these things you know sometimes you've only got 20 minutes or you know, you can't, you know sometimes you've got couple of minutes to get a shot so you're always so focused on what you need to do that it mm. you're not really thinking too much about you're not you know, who these people are and stuff like that and also once once you've met a few people you kind of find that for the most part they're just you know they're fairly you know they just want to be treated like everyone else you know, they're just uh, people <laughs> yeah it's i think sometimes if you're if you like fanboy it a bit too hard then it, it can make them feel a little weird and it also makes you make, makes you look a little bit unprofessional you know mm. you know they they need to feel confident that you're you know what you're doing and you're going to do a good job and it's worth it's worth worth their time and you're going to make them look good but i would you know it, it, it definitely hasn't always been easy but what i did i do did used to do and sometimes still do is you know i might have a look at what they you know do a little bit of research about the person you know, where where they've just been on tour, what they've done. You know, if there's you know, fight, uh, and any sort of point of reference. You know, whether it's a football team or um, like you know, an artist, you know, they like just finding a few bits of conversation that you can, you know, just get that sort of thing. That yeah, just get things people comfortable and things flowing is is a, is a good way. Yeah, so keep it friendly between the professional. I mean, I've even been told before that if you if you meet a star and you say like, "Oh, can I have a picture of you?" You're kind of putting yourself in a fan category rather than on par with them. So is yeah. that something you would suggest as well? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I so, like some people do get photos with people when they work with them. Like personally, it's not something I've ever done. But um, but yeah, I think I think you're right. It does. Yeah. It, yeah, it remit it puts a weird dynamic into the thing. Yeah. Where, as I like to treat them as like a, a normal person and just make them you know, feel confident that I'm going to do do a good job with them. You know. Yeah, essentially, they're your client, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, what have we got here? Uh, yeah, so 
uh, yeah, like I was saying about just taking every opportunity I could to, to elevate things. Um, so this was uh, Dua Lipa when she was, uh, in the summer, she was just starting to break really big. And I had um, like a, maybe like a four or five minute slot with her, just, literally just before she went on stage at Glastonbury. And um, I, I, put, I talked to one of my uh, colleagues who was working there with me to come along and hold a light for me just so I could get, you know, a shot that was elevated slightly above like, like the normal, you know, stand against the port cabin sort of situation you have at a festival. And it worked really well because she came out looking, you know, absolutely flawless. And I like that weird juxtaposition of her and it's like pretty grubby backstage area, you know. Yeah, no, I love that. And I love all the colours in that as well. They look so vibrant. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, it, it worked well as a, as a composition. But yeah, when I, I remember when I first went back, back out, it's it, it just mud everywhere. And yeah. She, she may have been looking flawless, but I've been on site for like two days already, so I was <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had any of these uh, singers ever like repost your pictures or a, a feedback to you and say, oh my God, Andy, I love this one that you've captured. Has that ever happened? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah sometimes, yeah, they'll, they'll uh, repost things or um, ask, you know, ask if they can see some of the shots. And it's always a really nice compliment when they do put things out into the, into the world and uh, sometimes you might shoot things for a magazine so the Mark Ronson shot we were we were looking at a moment ago um that was originally for the enemy but um his his press person was at the shoot really liked the look of what I'd done and asked to see them and then Sony then bought those shots from me to use for worldwide press which is always like a really you know it's a, it's a massive compliment and it, it yeah it helps helps build your confidence that you're doing something right um yeah again yeah just yeah more of making the most of opportunities and, and bringing i use a lot of um battery uh battery flash packs which allow you to create sort of studio lighting on location which yeah it's probably my my favorite thing to do is find cool locations and light them well and yeah always look for that slightly different different angle i think they're cool you know in terms of someone um, getting into photography and they might be thinking, oh, I haven't got loads of money to start buying all this equipment, I can't afford these lights, what would you say in that situation? Um, well, to be honest, it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's something you build up over time. Um, but when I was still working a, a part-time job, any photography work I did have, I used to just use that to reinvest yeah. Um, into, um, yeah, into, into camera equipment. But um, yeah, you don't necessarily, I mean, this this image here was yeah, it's, uh, obviously my normal camera, one of my lenses, but it was just a single light, uh, which, you know, it's, it, they don't always have to be super technical. And you can do a lot with just natural light um, or very basic lighting. But um, yeah, it's, but then it's not always about the gear, but then you will find yourself limited by what you're using. But it's, yeah, you don't, you don't need thousands of thousands of pounds worth of equipment to, um, to take your photos for sure. Um, I mean, here is, is a good example is um, this photo of Brendan Yuri um, is was literally just shot with a, a normal speed light, which is a couple of hundred pounds on a, a weird little flash bracket. Um, ironically, it was photographed against the side wall of a really expensive studio that his label was booked out for the press day. And I had a load of my, you know, my expensive lighting in the corner for another setup. The shot I actually liked was the one that I shot on this really simple, simple flash bracket setup. Who's that one? Um, yeah, and then as you, yeah, you know, eventually you can get to that sort of stage where you really, you know, you can, you can, you can sort of pre, pre visualize an idea, and it's really re rewarding when you can, you know, go into a place and actually you know, get something looking like like you had it in your mind. Hmm. And in terms of like um, the magazines that you've worked for and things, do they supply you the equipment? Do they supply the studio? Or do you need to organize that yourself? Um, it can be different scenarios for different clients. Um, I mean, it, back, back in the day, the enemy used to have um, an account that you could use for, for um, like, the, the hiring um or like often the, uh if it's a press day a label will sort of um book out a studio 
per day and all the various magazines will come and shoot them there so you can use use that kind of stuff there um for a while i was until i before i could afford my own life and i did if it was a good if it was a big shoot i used to just you know use some of my own money to hire out lighting for the day just to make sure that that those shots look really good it's a bit of a speculate to accumulate thing you know if you you know you spend a bit of your own money yeah to make <laughs> some sort of connection, they then trust you with a with a the bigger budget sheet yeah essentially it's like building your portfolio isn't it so you need to have the good work there to prove that you're you're worthy of other shoots in the future yeah definitely you know it's you know if you, you know, say if, you, if you're in front of someone like brendan yuri or something it's worth spending you know that 50 60 pound on an extra bit of lighting to make sure that the shot you know those those shots can be like really pivotal things so it's, it's definitely early on it can be worth you know, yeah yeah yeah, take, taking a little bit less profit and just to make sure that the, the shots look amazing. Mm. Um, and yeah, interestingly as well, this may look like a, a nice studio. This was actually in the upstairs of a, a reptile rescue center up in Leeds. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, there, to the side, there are all these big boxes of snakes that they had for us to use. And I just set up a material background in the, uh, in the middle of it all. <laughs> oh, good. Um, right. So yeah, we have. Sorry. I said obviously shooting with an exotic animal, health and safety would have been quite crucial there. <laughs> well, yeah, we did have the um, the people from the from the reptile centre on hand, um, but yeah, I think the the concept had come from a band. So I said to Larissa, the singer, when she turned up, I was like, "Oh, so have you have you handled a lot of snakes before?" She, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she, uh, she smashed it, so it was all good. Um, but, yeah, I was just going to say some of these these frames. I just wanted to show, you, like going on from what I was just saying, the reality of what you're dealing with sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, often people think you're always working in a glamorous studio with like five assistants bringing you uh, chilled glasses of cranberry juice and stuff. But quite often you're you know you're working with locations or in dressing rooms. This particular one was a Kerrang cover that I did with. Um, band called Neck Deep. We did it at the singer uh, Ben's house um, and it turned out it was raining and the only place we had enough space to uh, set up the lights was in his in his garage. So <laughs> yeah. amazingly that shot that you can see on the cover was uh, was yeah shot amongst all the all the clutter of his garage. Um, and yeah this one That says again, a lot about your skills you can have yeah, Sorry, there's a bit of a lag, isn't there? But I was going to say that um, in terms of your skills, it says a lot about you if you're able to make those shots in the likes of a reptile center or a garage, and they still come out looking amazing. It says a lot about your your skill set. Yeah, I think um, working working as an editorial or music topic, I think you need to be really adaptable and flexible, and just you know. Think, you know, some, you know, sometimes you're in a bit of a nightmare scenario and you have to like think on your feet about you know, what you can do you know, to, to make it happen. You know, and you, you know, you, could, you bring, bring the things that you think you might need to enable you to make that happen. But for example, this, this, this shot that's on here, um, I've just taken my, a couple of battery powered lights with me and we've met um, Matt the singer in, in, uh, near Paddington to do the interview. And then they were just like, oh, can you find, find somewhere nearby to do the, the photos? And it was, I just couldn't find anything. And eventually went down this side street and there was a black wall on the, on a, uh, on the side of a pub. So I just set up a single light there, got them to stand near, near to the wall and uh, you know, just shot it in this, this really moody way. And uh, Yeah, I, lo I love the shot, but yeah, the, we're, we're, <laughs> we're just on a side street in London um, yeah, on the pavement there. That looks like it's shot in a studio. That's crazy. That was taken on the side of the pub. Yeah. Um, in terms of the realities as well, um, have you ever had anyone that you've gone to take a picture of and they've been maybe not very easy to work with? Have you ever come across that? And if that has been the case, how did you overcome that and still get what you needed to do from that project? Um, well, it's, I mean, yeah, it's oft, often when you're doing shoots, you're, you know, it might be, you know, before they, before someone's going to play a show, so obviously their mind is on the show, or they might be on a day off on tour, and they, you know, they're they're tired. They've been on the on the road for weeks, 
but and you know yeah the last yeah. thing they want to do is have you point the camera at it and it's i think it's about being able to judge the situation you know sometimes you go in and you know you try and create a good a good a good vibe and you know get things flowing sometimes you can clock there they're just like right let's just get this done as quickly as possible and in that sort of case you just you need to shut up and uh, really <laughs> just power through. Interestingly, you should say that if we go to this this shot here. So this was a Koran cover with um, Josh Holm from Queens of the Stone Age. And yeah, I've flown out to Switzerland to do it. I was quite excited to do it. He's a very cool, cool guy and I was hoping to get some like, really cool shots. Mm. I got to the venue and you know, there's already a bit of a bad vibe in the you know he he like he's really ill and like there's already talk that the, potentially the shoot might not even happen at all so i'm like oh man. um and basically the the magazine has wanted this like quite a, a dingy sort of moody like bar vibe almost like you were having a late night drink with him and the the venue is really really modern and clean like running around like trying to find somewhere to do it with a, a panic rising and eventually i found this nespresso bar upstairs and cleaned out all the all the coffee bits and set up some lights to make it look quite moody. Eventually, it came through that he was, he was going to give me like you know maybe like eight or ten minutes or so um, to to get to get it done. So I had all the lights set up, ready to go. I knew where I wanted him to be, so just, yeah, brought him in. Um, he did his thing, looked cool for about six seven minutes, and uh, yeah, that that rank, uh, that cover was was in the bag but yeah it was it was definitely one of those situations where i was like right just, you know, he doesn't want to be here so just make he was probably in the right mood for that particular shoot then isn't he <laughs> it yeah, was like, like i say fortunately he's a very he's a he's a cool he's a cool guy and you know he does the movie look well so <laughs> it, it, it fits it fits the vibe for this one but yeah at the time i was definitely you know i knew that it was potentially going i was going to have very limited time to do it so i was like right i need to prepped and ready to go just, you know, just get as much out of this as I can while he's yeah give it, get what he's got to give me <laughs> I guess that you've probably also got to have a quite a tough skin in those situations because you could take that personally couldn't you yeah yeah I think it can especially you know, guys like Josh Harmon you know, like big D's you know quite high profile and stuff and they're, you know, they're these guys are like proper sort of rock and roll outlaws some of them so it's easy to be quite rattled by it so I think you know you have to sort of go in, you know, ready, you know, ready, ready for whatever. And like you know, sometimes I might, if I if I've got a friend who I know has photographed someone that I'm going to photograph, I might, you know, I might chat to them and be like, oh, how how were they? What do they like? What do they not like? You know, you might do things like sometimes I'll make playlists to shoot just to have some music on in the room, so it's a bit less of an awkward sort of vibe. Just do whatever you can to make them feel comfortable because they're, they're musicians they're not models they don't necessarily like having their photos taken so you just yeah. do whatever you can to make make it painless and enjoyable and just it's it's about you know if you go into it and you're you're not confident or you're feeling awkward then the energy in that room is going to be awkward and the shots are going to look weird um a thing i always do is when i when i first meet the artist i try and just run them through what my idea for the shoot is, what what I want it to look like, and you know, they might try and get them on board with it, sell them the idea, and also if they're not into it, then try and you know collaborate with them to find something they do want to do. Because you know, I respect that they want to be in charge of their image, and you know, if if, if you're making someone do something they don't feel comfortable doing, the, the shots are going to look rubbish. You know, it's going to be very obvious in the shot that they're not into it. So, yeah. Yeah. And obviously you mentioned earlier doing some research first on the person that you're going to photograph. So you've kind of got that link of something in common, whether that's a football team or whatever. So that probably helps kind of as an icebreaker as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, yeah, if we go to this shot here is um, Kevin Smith, he's like a director and actor. And like this, so this is, this is taken on what uh, quite often with Hollywood stuff, it will be you know, a it's, it's like a press junket. So basically, they have a hotel room for the day, and all these press, you know, they have a half hour slot. They come in, do the interviews and photos and stuff. So you're like, right, how am I going to get something different and you know, get something that he's going to be into? So again, I took a piece of material into the hotel room, clipped it up, 
they did the interview and I think I had about six minutes afterwards. But um, yeah, one of my friends had a, like a, a Kevin Smith action figure, which I managed to get hold of, and brought it in and obviously he was like, <laughs> found it quite a funny thing. So it's, it's, you know, I gave him something to interact with and play with. And, you know, you know, you, you, know, you bring the energy in, into the room and you know, give them something to work with and, and often they'll give you something back, you know? Yeah, and make them feel like they've got some kind of creative control. They're not just being bossed around, told what to do. Yeah, yeah, totally. But, and also, I think they, like, fans and artists and stuff like that, they, they appreciate if you put some thought into what you're doing rather than just being like, right, uh, stand against that wall. You know, just, I think, yeah, they feel like you're just going through the motions and they're like, why am I, you know, why am I giving up my time to do this? Um, Else we have here. Oh, this one, I was just going to say, um, a thing I'm, I'm, all, I'm always trying to do is, you know, at these big festivals, you might find yourself in a photo pit with about 20 or 30 other photographers, like all of whom are going to be shooting on similar cameras and lenses to you. So it's like, right, how, you have to think, how am I going to get something that is different to what everyone else's photos are going to look like? So for example, here, you can sort of see in the foreground, you know, like 20 other photographers there all getting the kind of like the, the obvious safe shot of um, Matt on the end of a ramp. But I, I, I went round to the back of a ramp, got the highest angle I could and sort of got this wide angle shot. So you get that feeling of what it's like there for him to be on the end of a ramp in front of that massive festival crowd. And again, you know, when the, the shots come out, that's going to stand out against everyone else's, you know, quite tight man with a microphone shot, you know. <laughs> Andy, we haven't got much time left and we've got loads of questions coming in. Would you be happy to move on to the Q&A? Yeah, or is there any more advice that you want to go on to before we do that? I think, I think we're good to go. Cool. Okay, let me try and put my camera back on as well. Yep. Um, and see how that goes. Right. So, um, I popped here for a young aspiring photographer. I've been given a lot throughout that session, but is there anything else that you think would be good? Uh, say top tips. Um, might have a couple of couple of a crew prepared. Um, yeah, I think the, the first thing is to, you know, the first thing is to get out there and start shooting. Wherever you are, there's going to be some sort of music scene. I mean, I was I was based in Cornwall when you know I started shooting music stuff, so you haven't really got any any excuse. You know, so get out there and start shooting is the is the, the first thing to do, you know. And you need to spend like like I said a couple of years just shooting lots of local shows, meeting people and, and getting your work up to that good standard, you know, be a harsh critic, you know, think how you can improve what you're doing. Um a, a, one thing I would say if you're you know coming through these days is to try and be increasingly you need to be multifaceted. So, you know, most digital cameras uh, digital SLRs shoot video these days, so it's definitely worth being able to make little social, little video edits for social media, um, having some like understanding of design and stuff like that. Because if, especially if you wanted to work as a touring photographer, being able to shoot bits and pieces of video is like that. I, I know for some people that's been that, you know, whether the, it came down to whether they could do that or not, to, as to whether they got the job. So definitely now, you know, it's it's a function that's on your camera. So I think it's definitely worth having some some understanding of of, of video for sure. Um, yeah, just but yeah, building that network. But I think that comes quite organically. But you know, just surround yourself with like, positive people. Like you know, build build a little crew. Whether it's you know, I've got some of my friends who are photographers. You know, it's don't it's not about being competitive with them. It's about you know. You know, I, I help them on shoots, they help me and, you know, find other people like stylists, hair and makeup people, just find like driven, motivated people who want to want to shoot and, you know, collaborate, build, build little crews, you know, that, that can make a big difference if you're working with a band who's quite young, they might not be particularly uh, fashionable, you know, if you've got a friend who's into fashion or wants to be a stylist, they can, you know, stuff like that can really elevate, elevate your early shoot. And you know that that high tide can you know it raises everyone, you know. Yeah, and you can inspire each other as well as yeah. helping each other as well. Yeah, 
We'll move on to another question. Um, hi, Andy. Big, big inspiration for me. So thanks for doing this. What would you say was the defining moment to launch your career? Um, I think it, it. I think it definitely has to go back to that um, that enemy awards win. You know that was that definitely plucked me from shooting weird little hardcore shows in, in crazy little venues in the southwest and you know sort of dumped me into you know, yeah a few months you know, yeah maybe about a year later flying to South Africa flying to Europe working on these big festival stages and like I say it was it was a really exciting if slightly terrifying experience but I, I like I said earlier I knew it, it was only going to come round once I couldn't say if Oh, maybe give me a couple more years so I'm ready. You know, you have to really grasp it because there's going to be a big queue of people behind you who are happy to happy to take it. Um, yes, and it, I think that just comes back to making sure sure you're you're visible. You know, these days social media is a massive platform for that. Obviously, Instagram probably the main one as a photographer. So, you know, you could have taken the world's greatest music photo, but if it's just sat on your hard drive, then it's, it's it's not going to get you anywhere. So, you know, once you're, you feel like your your work is getting strong and you're feeling more confident about it, make sure you're getting it out into the world, getting it in front of the right people, using all the hashtags, tagging venues and bands and labels and stuff like that. And yeah, like I say, competitions are still still a big thing and a really useful way of um, you know, getting yourself exposed and getting your your work seen by you know, the right people. This is a really interesting question, this one. I'm wondering whether anyone else in the audience also feels the same. Um, I enjoy photography, but I don't think my parents would ever agree to me going down that route. Do you have any tips to help me convince them to see the light? <laughs> That's, I mean, I, my parents were, were supportive, if a little baffled by it all. They, <laughs> they, it definitely took a good few years for them to actually believe like this was a thing like this was a, a job you could do so i think it's you know it's it's funny like all the things i do sometimes there's weird little things that like help them understand it like the 1975 shot that i had earlier in the in the talk um that ended up being used in the sunday times magazine as as a double page spread for a feature about them and I, my mum was like you know very excited telling her friends you know, get the sunday times you know oh, yeah, I'll pick that but i think it's I think as the best way to convince convince them is to prove that you're like really committed to it. You know, whatever yeah. you do, whether you want to be in a band or something, you've got to give it like a hundred percent. And the stuff that is very competitive and there's no obvious route through it, you need to you know, work way harder than you know if you want to do a, a slightly more normal job. You know, a lot of people want to do this kind of thing, so you need to you know, work work harder than them. But I think yes. Yeah, yeah, prove prove to your parents that you know that you you are totally committed to it, and you know show you know show that you really want it. And I think they will. Sorry, got to finish what you were saying. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you're if you're only sort of you know going out once every two weeks to shoot a concert, and you're like, no, I have got a job. This is my job. You you know you need really need to like be proactive and and prove that you're prove that you want it. And like I say, I, you know, I was I was shooting enemy commissions, but I was also working like part time for like for a while until I felt like you know until that like time point came and I needed to take that take that step forward. But yeah, so, you know, be very proactive at it and you know prove to them that you know, and do and do your research. You know, show to them, you know, show to them that you thought about how you, know, you understand the industry and you, you like, figured out what your your route is going to be. But anyway, you know, if you want to yeah, be a rock and roll. Parents be happy, don't they? So if they, <laughs> if they see you enjoying it and being happy, they'll probably be on board. We'll go for one more question, and then Andy, if you're able to answer any later on, perhaps we can get that organised on social media or something. That'd be quite good. Yeah. Um, so this last one we're going to go for is: Are you freelance or do you work for an agency? So I am freelance, but I have I have a so yeah, so I'm I don't get paid a, a retainer by anyone, but obviously I have established relationships with like, like Kerrang, you know, I'm on their roster as like one of their um one of their photographers and so yeah, I have a lot of repeat clients I have good relationships with. But I, I yeah. do that like my work 
generally come from. But yeah, there's there's no yeah, it's it's a slightly precarious thing. But it's also you know I have you know I don't I don't just work for Kerrang. You know, I do stuff for the labels, various brands. I work with um, various creative agencies who create like social media content for bigger brands and stuff. So I think that's important as well. Is not to totally put you know, all your eggs in 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 one in one basket you know especially in these sort of times you know photography is constantly evolving so you know some print magazines will stop you know you know they, they can go under you know uh, like photo editors and designers like art directors can change and all of a sudden they might have the top photographers that they like working with so i think it's about spreading your your net quite wide and you know, same I've, I've had a lot of big things happen like people I work with these days who have come from saying yes to just like weird little jobs that I was like I don't know why I'm doing this but yeah fine I'll do it and then you know they might go on to work somewhere else or you know so you know I yeah big client it's it's not it's not you know you don't always get direct approached directly by these people it might be that someone you worked with previously at something else then goes on so it's like I say about building that network and Building a good reputation and being easy to work with, yeah, just being nice and you know, submitting edits on time, being professional with emails, all that kind of thing. Yeah, word of mouth goes a long way in this type of industry, so I definitely agree with that. And that brings us basically to the end of today's Learn Lounge, which has been a particularly brilliant one. Um, thank you so much, Andy, for all of your advice. It's been interesting session and of course we're very interested to study it's an open day coming up so you can find out more information about that by visiting plymouthart.onlineopendate.com and just a reminder also that we're raising money for the children's trust which is the uk's leading charity for children with brain injury so if you would like to donate you can do so however Small amount of now. And thank you. And we'll be back next week with Tom Griffiths, one of Sunday Times Top 100 and disruptor, and disruptor, where he'll tell you about his journey and why you shouldn't be boxed in to a particular career path. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in, and we'll see you next time.